What I have here is a Sun Ultra 5 workstation from around 1998 to 2002. This is an old Sun Unix machine running Solaris, so it's kind of interesting to look at compared to a normal x86 PC, as inside it's very different. On the front of the machine we can see we have a Sun Microsystems logo, the Ultra 5 logo, floppy drive with this flap which according to the service manual can take a PCMCIA card module. Currently that's not fitted and I've never seen one fitted in any of these machines so I don't know how common they were. CD-ROM drive, soft power button, and a sticker there saying UltraSpark driven, which is the CPU in this machine. The Ultraliner machines use the UltraSparks, whereas previously you had ones like the SuperSparks and TurboSparks, so this is an UltraSpark. Another interesting thing with these old Unix machines is the keyboards. Obviously from here on along it's just standard with some additional keys down here for power and contrast, which must be able to control the original Sun monitor. However, over here you'll find there's additional keys for the Solaris operating system, which is kind of cool, as well as a big massive help button up there. It's not a particularly fancy keyboard, I mean it's just rubber dome, but it is quite a nice type on compared to most rubber domes. Um, and the keys are all very high quality, like the, that's proper like moulded die, like it's not just printed on letters, which is good, so it's in really good condition. And LEDs integrated into some of the keys. You've also got interesting keys such as Control Alt and then this diamond key compared to other keys you see as well as the Compose key which is quite cool which lets you print special characters so that's pretty neat you also have this Sun 3 button mouse which is well, it's a basic ball mouse but it's got 3 buttons on it and like the old Apple machines the Sun mouse connects into the keyboard and the keyboard then connects into the computer over a serial like protocol so it's not a standard separate like PS2 or anything it is its own protocol which meant when I got the machine with a broken keyboard I had to go through a lot of fuss trying to get a keyboard that actually worked with it so we'll take a look at the machine running and then we'll take it apart and see what's inside because it is kind of interesting compared to most normal machines. So here I have the machine connected to my ThinkVision LC20X monitor. It's a 1920 by 1200 monitor but it can handle pretty much any re resolution I've thrown at it which is great for old machines like this as they can really output funny resolutions. So I'm going to switch it on with the power switch at the back and you'll see that when we power it on, as soon as mains power is applied, it will start, start up. This, has been, this, it's, this was set like this because the pre-machine was previously used as a server where you'd want it to power up automatically in the event of a power failure. This wouldn't be the standard operation. The machine's now booting, and in a few seconds you'll see something come on the screen. So here we see the machine's now trying to boot. So it's complaining that the ID prom contents are invalid, that's because the battery on the ROM chip has failed. This will need replaced, it's quite tricky, you'll see when we get inside later about how all that works. I might do it, we'll see. Um, but we can see here it has a 400 megahertz UltraSpark 2i CPU um, and 512 megs of RAM which is a lot for this machine. Also because this is a Sun machine and not a standard x86 system it doesn't use a traditional BIOS instead it uses OpenBoot firmware which is more similar to like modern EF UEFI systems where you have a bit more powerful firmware on the system. So it's now dropped this OK prompt which you can do various things from, you can power it on, you can reboot it, you can set configuration options like that power up in terms of power failure, um, in the event of power failure. But what we can now do is we need to tell it to boot from the disk. You can also tell it to boot from the network and other things here, so we'll hit that and it should start to boot. So it's still complaining about that prom, prom failing. Sun OS 5.8, this is Solaris 8, that's the alternate name for it. And the other thing to note here is that these machines, despite being from the 90s, are 64 bit. They're some of the first 64 bit machines. Okay, so we can now see the machine has booted up and we're now at the login screen. So I'm just going to log in as root, just because that's easy. And that'll take us into the common desktop environment. This is the desktop environment Solaris 8 uses. Previous versions used open windows, which is a older environment, but this is just one that this operating system was designed for. So we're into it here and you can see the main screen. So what we have is this bar in the bottom, it's the various things. Oh, it's trying to connect the all the way. I don't like it's doing that on boot. Um, we can see down here 
various different options. There's multiple desktop support, which is kind of cool, given that you know Linux operating systems have this as well, and Windows only recently just got this, but yep, you have multiple desktop support, which is quite cool. Um, you also have various things, so there's the cards, so that's address books and things, your file management, text notes, applications, you've got your email here. Um, these all sort of pop up and down. Um, here you've got various different things, so here we can see there's the web browser. We'll pull that open. So there we go, there's a web page. Um, we're going to have to stop it there because what it will do is it tries to load the Sun homepage, which then redirects the Oracle homepage, which then crashes Netscape. So that's not great, so we'll have to um, get around that. I'm going to try going to web page and see if it works. Um, it doesn't seem to be. I've been having weird network issues with the machine. It's just a bit tricky to get on a modern network. Um, but it is running, it's just being a wee bit temperamental in terms of network. Um, I have been able to load web pages on it before, and it's really what you'd expect. It's Netscape 4. It half loads them and they're all a bit broken but you can sort of use it and if you've got like a really old dated website it might work actually quite well so I'll just close that um, you can also right click, right -click this, you'll get various different options that are here including the terminal which you can pull up and see so if you can see what's going on with the network so ifconfig um, ifconfig-hme0 um, yes yeah, so you can see here it's the network's up and running and it's on 10.0.250, that's correct IP, correct netmax, correct broadcast, so that seems okay. Ping 10.0.2.1. But it's not reaching out to the network, which is a bit strange. Up. No, it's not IF up. Yes, let's see. Uh, HME zero down. Config HME zero up. So again, the network showing is up, but it's not working. Um, oh, no, no, that's weird. <laughs> Half an IP address is alive apparently. Yeah, so it's not seeing the rest of the network. Don't know what's wrong. What I have noticed is that the Ethernet address here is showing as 0 .0 .0 .0. Um I'm wondering if that's to do with the prom failing because I know these machines do store the MAC address in the NVRAM. So if that's been lost, that would need to be reset. But it does work on the internet. It's just not doing it today. Um, yeah, so that's basic tour of it. I mean, it's a standard Unix system, so commands like ls will work, it has vi installed. Um, it's basically what you'd expect. So I'm going to power the machine off and we'll take a look inside. So just power off the command, we'll do it. Standard Unix commands. That means that's machine powered down. So now we'll pop it open and see inside. Okay, so here I am around the back of the machine now. What we can see here is standard ATX power supply and then down here there's audio, it has a built-in sound card which is quite unusual for a machine of this age especially for a sort of sun workstation type thing That's our proprietary keyboard port which is kind of hard to see, that's the plug on the keyboard It's almost like a sort of, it's almost like PS2, there's a standard in plug but it is a sort of proprietary serial protocol Now over here we have various other ports, um, notice there's like no USB or anything on this it's Although when this machine came out, USB was definitely a big thing, this machine just didn't have it. What we have instead, we have two serial ports, labelled B and, well, A, somewhere, yeah, there it is, down there. Um, parallel port, VGA and Ethernet. One that I found kind of interesting on this is that it has 25 pin serial, which is fine, but it's reverse gender. So normally a 25 pin serial port would be male on the machine, but this is a female connector which actually means the serial connector is the same as the parallel one, which is a bit confusing. I wonder how many times people plug the wrong things in. It's a bit strange, but it seems that only Sun seem to do this. All PCs I've seen will have a standard male 25-pin connector on them, but this has female, which is a bit strange. Um, so now we'll take the top off. It's just held with these two screws here and here, so I'll just take those out and we'll get the top off. Okay, so here we are again inside the machine now. Um, this machine is really interesting because it's a sort of hybrid between what would be a standard PC 
and a Sun machine. Um, previous machines used SCSI disks and their, and their proprietary SBUS protocol, whereas here you can see it's actually using PCI and standard IDE for the disks. But the machine is still obviously a Sun UltraSpark machine, so they're kind of interesting as sort of hybrid. This was the first machine to do that. So what you can see here obviously is standard ATX power supply and just an IDE hard drive, it's a Seagate there, it's just a 8.6 gig it says. Yeah, it's sort of fairly average. One of these quite nice ones that they used to do where they have like rubber on them which they've sort of got built-in anti-vibration mounts, kind of cool. And there's the back of the CD-ROM drive, basically what you'd expect. Floppy drive, and this is the place where that PCM CIE reader would be. It's currently got this metal blanking plate. Down here you can just about see there's four sticks of RAM. Each of those is 128 megs to give a total of 512. And yeah, so then down here we've obviously got the PCI riser card. And one slot in here that I don't have a clue what it does, um, quite hard to make out, but that's it just, just there, there's that black slot. It looks like it's for some sort of riser, but in the service manual it actually isn't even listed, so I don't have a clue what it's for. Um, here's the riser card, there's the graphics, which as you can see is a, um, trying to get a bit better light here, um, is a ATI Rage Pro um, PCI, so the network all runs off, the uh, graphics all runs off the PCI bus as well. Um, some various different chipsets. This is the clock with built-in battery. This is the part that's failed, so this is we need to work on to repair it. What we just need to do is take the top off, sort of cut into the chip and attach some wires onto a separate battery, which is certainly possible, it has been done a lot, it just takes time. Um, and there we can see the ribbon cables from the breakout for the serial and parallel going down to headers on the board. Now over here we can find the actual CPU which is on a separate board, I'll take that out in a minute, and the one cooling fan which blows air across the CPU. It's still quite warm actually after running for a wee bit. It's kind of interesting. So we'll get that CPU taken out. Okay, so I'm going to take the CPU board out. So you can see it's held in with one screw here with a retention clip going over it. So we take this one screw out. The, the screw comes out, retention clip sort of lifts off and comes out the back. And that's now released the, released the CPU. So it's actually quite simple. It just sort of sits over there and just holds it in place. What you need to do is just lift it up in all four corners. Um, to slowly remove it from the system. It's quite hard to get in, obviously, especially knowing there's this big sharp metal bar over your hand, which doesn't make it that enjoyable trying to remove, but it is possible. You sort of need to get it from all the corners and slowly work its way out. There we go. It's fine. There we go. And that's it, released, and we just lift it out. So take a look at underneath that in a second, but what we have here is the UltraSpark 2i CPU, 400 megahertz. Um, two heat sinks, obviously the main chip's under this. I'm not going to take it off, but it's just what you'd expect. It's a basic chip with a integrated heat spreader on it. And then this heat sink here, that I don't know what's under there. I don't want to take it off. But you see on the bottom there is quite a lot of contacts, so I'm wondering if that's some sort of off-chip cache that is cooled. Here's obviously the base of the CPU with this big metal clip holding the cooler on. And two big long bus connections to the motherboard. So these are quite nice. It's actually, don't know if you can see in there, it's actually a sort of card edge. So it's not pins or anything that can easily get bent, so that should be quite reliable. Um, it's a pretty neat design. And then obviously a few capacitors on the thing. As you can see, they're all Sanyo capacitors. These machines will use the highest quality components. They're not going to cheap out on a machine of this age, or a machine of this price. These things were really expensive when they were new. So now here we are under the CPU. So there's this one clip that holds the CPU in place. Um, and then we have this Sun chip, and this other Sun chip here. All the chips in this machine, lots of them are made by Sun. They will make their own chips. Um, which like, you don't see in a modern machine, you don't see a motherboard that comes with a, you know, an ASUS chip on it or a gigabyte chip where back here, you know, Sun would make their own silicon for these machines. Um, here's the edge connector for the CPU, there's two different ones on either, one on either side. That's there's the Einstein 21, which I'm pretty sure is a part number for this, they've had various names for all their boards. This one's the Einstein, obviously. Here we have some voltage regulation for it and a bunch of capacitors. But as you can see, even for a machine of this age, all the capacitors are in like excellent condition. Not a single one is bulging that I can see on this machine, which is pretty good for a machine of this age. Um, but again, as I said, the quality of the components in these machines were just excellent. Okay, so I've just put the CPU back in. Um, it was fairly easy, just basically push it and clip it down and put that retention clip over the top. So I just put the top back on the machine, it's just basically exactly, exactly as you'd expect from a machine like this. The metal cover goes over it. And then pushes forward and always jams on something because that's just exactly what these things need to do. Come on, there we go. 
and then just both screws go on either side. Just put it there, screw it in. Okay, so that's that back together. Now the final thing to look at is on the bottom. There is some information. You'll see on the bottom of the screen here there's quite a bit of information about it. Um, you can see we have this which contains the market number on that is part numbers, as well as the MAC address which actually looks different to what I saw on the post screen, so I wonder if that is to do with the NVRAM failure, so I'll need to look into that and that would probably explain the networking issues. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely have a play with that. Might need to set that MAC address into the prom and see if that fixes it. So definitely take a look at that. I'll maybe make an upcoming video if I get that sort of sorted out. Um, I'll stick here, just general sort of compliance information. Um, assembled in the UK, which is pretty cool. Um, if I had to guess, it was probably made actually in Scotland in Linlithgow, which is where Sun used to have a big manufacturing plant, which is only it's not that far from me here in Edinburgh. It's only a few miles, so it's a few miles west. So it's kind of cool actually. It's made fairly locally. Um, if it is actually made in that plant, which I'm pretty sure that's where all sun stuff in the UK was built. And obviously big, solid rubber feet. I mean, these things are very solidly made. Okay, so here we now have a quick bit of a history about this machine. Isn't what I like about having old machines is knowing about the history of where they came from, what they were previously used for. So this is the website of the TARDIS project, which is a project at the University of Edinburgh. It's a student-run computer system that I am part of, and it's basically a bunch of old servers that we all run and muck around with and have fun on and do random stuff with. Um, all the machines are donated, um, generally quite old. Um, that's how it currently looks. It's just a server rack. Which, yeah, it's pretty neat. It's mostly all Dell hardware nowadays. It's gone quite modern. Um, but this machine was our old router. So you can see there it's TARDIS's router. Um, it's got the onboard Ethernet interface with the MAC address, which if you look at that and compare it to the MAC address on the bottom of the machine, you'll see it's the same. It's the same machine. And it used to have a PCI, Express, a PCI Ethernet card fitted as well for the internal network. Um, so it's quite cool to see a bit of information about it. You can see there it's a Ultra 5, which obviously it is. Um, and when we used it, we used to run it on Debian. Um, we didn't have much spot, uh, Solaris stuff. We used to run Debian on these machines. And it was quite under how long this machine was actually in use for. It could be kind of interesting to see. Um, because the wiki we can actually tell. So, yep. Yeah. Um, it was decommissioned, as you can see here, in 2010, that would be. Yeah. Yeah, so this machine was actually decommissioned in... It was still in use until 2010, running as our router, which is kind of cool. We've actually come a lot, quite modern fairly quickly. Also, a sort of remnant from it being a router, as you can see, actually, on the Ethernet port. It's quite hard to see with the angle, but it's got EXT written on it for external, so that would be the external network connection which matches up with what it says on the wiki. Okay, so that was a quick tour of my Sun Ultra 5 workstation. Um, don't forget to like the video if you liked it and comment, rate and subscribe and all that sort of stuff. And hopefully I'll be doing more videos in the future with of various other old computers, some Suns, IBM, Apple, random other PC things, interesting bits of hardware. I've got a huge pile of stuff I need to go through and sort out so I'll go and make some videos on that and if I ever come around to doing other interesting things with this machine, you'll probably see it again in the future. So yeah, thanks for watching.